And it is with great pleasure that I introduce John Bain as our presenter today. John? Well, good morning, Benson. You can hear me fine? Absolutely. Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Bain, and I lead Stroudwater Revenue Cycle Solutions, which is the Revenue Cycle Division of Stroudwater Associates. Uh, I am joined today by my two colleagues, Lori Daigle and Lori Beaudry. Uh, both Lori Daigle and Lori Beaudry are certified coders and revenue cycle experts, so I'm very thankful for them to for them joining us today, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing a lot of these um, findings that they've been able to unearth over the last uh, week or two. Um, so on behalf of my team, I'd, I'd like to welcome you to this conversation and, and really thank you for trusting us with your valuable time today. Uh, I know that uh, right now one of the most valuable resources you guys have is your time. Uh, so we are very grateful uh, that you're uh, spending some of that time with us today. Um, before we move forward, a few housekeeping uh, items um, before we get started. So at the conclusion of uh, today's webinar, we will uh, generate um, files that will provide you both the recording and the slides. Uh, please be patient for the, with those. Uh, it takes a little bit of time for those things to compile. Uh, all of the attendees will receive an email uh, with links to both of those. Uh, so please be patient. We will absolutely get those out to you. Um, also, from the perspective of questions, everyone's got questions. What we've got is we've got three different uh, possibilities for you to be able to ask questions, and we absolutely encourage you to do so. Um, you can absolutely, during the presentation, uh, type those questions into the chat box. Um, you can also, we've created a coding support at stroudwater.com email address. Uh, which you can send us your questions and then we would be able to respond those directly to you. Or you could also, uh, upon receipt of the links for both the presentation and the recording, uh, respond back to us with questions. Uh, we will work hard to uh, respond to all of those uh, in writing and if need be, what we'll try to do is we'll also reach out uh, via phone if we think that uh, that might be a better vehicle. So. Um, as we move forward here, a few weeks ago, we provided uh, a 90 minute webinar focusing on revenue cycle crisis management. Um, if you are unable to attend that presentation, it is available for download on our website. So we'd encourage you to be able to go um, out and look at that as well. Today's conversation builds upon and really leverages some of the topics covered during that last presentation. So we're not gonna go through all of the nitty gritty details of that. This is really more meant to update you on activity that's happened over the last uh, two weeks or so since we last spoke with you. Um, so what are we gonna try to do today during uh, this conversation? We wanna provide you the latest updates on telemedicine, laboratory code availability, and uh, ICD-10 updates, very important for your coders. Uh, we wanna discuss some waiver applicability. Uh, we really also wanna give you an opportunity. A lot of questions have uh, arisen around uh, the uh, documentation concerns uh, surrounding uh, a lot of the telemedicine codes. So we're gonna spend some time trying to give you some pointers and give you some uh, insights on how best to help your practitioners um, really document compliantly. Um, we want to also get into some of these questions around RHC participation, uh, split billing of telehealth codes, uh, alternate site process um, from a billing perspective. Um, we want to give you some insights on the new code availability. And we really also want to discuss, as we're moving through this, business office strategies that can really you know, ensure proper claim adjudication, timely follow-up, and representative reimbursement, because that is really what we're looking for right now, is we wanna make sure that everything gets paid timely. Um, so billing guidelines and payer expectations for telehealth services, they are being updated regularly. So in order for us to really take advantage of all of the updates and the applicability of those codes, revenue cycle staff have to understand the correct use and implementation of these services to ensure clean claim submission and timely reimbursement. We can't afford anything to be delayed. We need our uh, cash quickly and we want to be paid appropriately. Likewise, we've got a lot of coding staff that's being cross-trained in real time while supporting clinicians remotely. So the world is shifting under our coders. So one of the things we're gonna to try to get through today is just to give people a better understanding of what coders are going up against and maybe give some strategies to help them out. So what we really wanna make sure of as well is that 
throughout this webinar, we've designed this to give participants actionable information that you can incorporate into your revenue cycle and really empower participants to ensure that, you know, documentation, um, code identification, and claim submission are primed for successful representation and reimbursement of those services. And as you'll look, what we've got is we've got sections that once the, the presentation is complete that you can print and you can bring to uh, people within your revenue cycle and use some of the things as examples, but engage in conversation. So what are we seeing, you know, across the industry as we talk to people throughout the, the, the country here? You know, one thing's for sure, the foundation of your revenue cycle is being tested, and it's really being tested unlike anything ever before. It's unprecedented. And what we need to make sure of is that we're not just talking about your revenue cycle getting through things. We want your revenue cycle to perform exceptionally. And the only way that can happen is, is that we have to really make sure that the expectations are set appropriately. So what we're also seeing is that if there are issues that are in your revenue cycle, so if we've got best practices and we're really good at that, those best practices are being challenged. Likewise, if we've got inefficiencies, all of those inefficiencies are being augmented. And we get some conversation and, and questions from people and say, hey, you know what? I'm on information overload. I seem to get a thousand emails a day. I, you know, what do I trust? And, and what do I ignore? And, and maybe even more importantly, I'm concerned, what am I missing, right? So all of this is leading into the fact that we've got staffing issues, which are forcing our supervisors, our coders, and our business office staff into new responsibilities. We're asking them to do things that they maybe have never done before, and we have no room for error. So that remote staffing has really provided hospitals issues surrounding the inadequacies of technology to support that remote activity. Things that we never really considered before are now coming up, and we're having to find ways around them. So coding and business office resources really are being stretched and really based on the pace and the volume of updates are often sort of in a state of operational uncertainty. And from a coding perspective and a business office perspective, it isn't a good thing to have people uncertain. So one of the things we want to try to do is eliminate some of those uncertain um, aspects and try to help guide you in a couple of ways to maybe take some uh, very positive steps. So, but here's the thing, there is some hope. You know, what we're also seeing is that there's increased communication across the full revenue cycle. People are talking to each other unlike they ever have before. There's improved direction, focus, and participation. We've got CEOs and CFOs coming to the table, having those conversations. They're learning more about their revenue cycle than they ever have before. A lot of it out of necessity, but we're forging relationships now, you know, that are based on necessity and empathy and ownership of process, which are all really good things. Administration's gaining a better understanding of the talents and abilities and limitations of the staff, their system, and their controls. So they're finding out, you know, really where they stand, who they can trust, who they can depend on, and who maybe they have to invest more in. So hospitals are working with system vendors to refine, expand, and improve reporting capabilities. Hugely important, especially as we start moving through this crisis and getting into uh, the rebound and making sure that we're all of a sudden getting back to steady state. And how do you know um, if we're back to steady state? We're seeing entrepreneurial approaches for accounts receivable and denial management. Wonderful things. People are collaborating together and trying to figure out how do we work that accounts receivable. And what we're hearing too is that, you know, that process will never be the same again. Things are, are better now. We're, we're starting to understand things a little bit better. People are implementing revenue cycle steering committees across the, the country. They're setting expectations and they're assigning process accountability, which is huge. Huge. It's allowing through that RAC, allowing for a daily focused action, which is really based on systematic and operational control of the revenue cycle. We're working based on necessity to gain better control of that revenue cycle. And, you know, one of the things that we're hearing from a lot of participants is that, you know, while data is important, actionable information for us is the key. So what we wanted to do today is we wanted to put some information together that gives you some of that actionable information so that you can take um, positive steps to eliminate some of your inefficiencies or even better, maybe augment some of the best practices that you've got. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to um, bring my colleague Lori Daigle um, into the conversation and have her walk through some of the, the findings that she's had on uh, updates that have kind of uh, come through over the last two weeks since we last talked. So welcome, Lori. Thanks, John. Um, it is important to note here that this is an update to the previous conversation. 
Some of the things we'll be discussing are new changes, and some of them are cha actually changes to the, the guidance that was in place two weeks ago. So we really have to continuously be looking back. Even if we think we have an answer, we have to keep going back and double checking. Uh, we should be looking at the CDC and CMS websites frequently, and not just the homepage or the COVID page. Some of these updates in CMS are coming through first in the newsroom, first in the FAQs, first in the MedLearn Matters, and they're not necessarily syncing up together. So we should be looking at a number of different um, sites within CMS. And likewise, be looking at this your state Medicaid pages to see what changes they're making, because new um, waivers are being approved by the federal government daily, and that might be changing the way your state is handling the Medicaid services. Commercial services, I've seen lots of changes in the commercial as well as they try to keep up with the CMS guidance. So something they may have um, approved or, or given guidance on two weeks ago may not be um, effective today. This is a snapshot of the COVID-19 update page from March 1st to March 31. And we're not going to look at these. The point of this is just to understand how quickly things are changing, how many updates are coming through, and how important it is to try to stay current with this. So some of the things that we'll be talking about are changes that, that came into effect since we last spoke, specifically the guidance around physicians being able to continue to practice even if their privileges may have expired in certain areas or if they um, have begun working in new areas. So they're actually relaxing, re relaxing those guidelines quite a bit. You're saying physicians can continue to work even if their privileges have expired, and they can begin working even if the process hasn't completely been finalized by the, the med staff or the governing body. They're also saying that um, qualified personnel can perform respiratory care procedures to the fullest extent of their licensure. That ha that's a big change because respiratory, as we know, has been one of the biggest needs in this crisis. So they're saying anybody who can provide this service to the fullest extent of their licensure can be brought on board for that. They're relaxing some of the guidelines around clinical um, nurse specialists, around nurse practitioners and PAs, so they can work as rural hospitals as long as they meet the state licensure in those arenas as well, and also for rural health centers, this has been relaxed. Some of the training and certification requirements for nurses' aides have been relaxed and waived as well. It's important to note that those things that are required, like, for instance, if they have to be minimum 18 years of age, if background checks are required, the, medically, the things that they need in order to serve the patient appropriately, like CPR, those things are still required. It's just those, those criteria that may not be as necessary to doing the job that has been relaxed. Um, verbal orders are now um, can be accepted. Now it's saying it doesn't have to be authenticated within 48 hours. It has to be authenticated as soon as possible. And they've also relaxed some of the guidelines around protocols. Um, some of the things that happened at, as of March 7th, they've expanded quite a bit of the services. And they have um, instituted some guidance around cost share waiving. For Medicare, they're saying that if a visit resulted in either administration of a COVID test or ordering of a COVID test, then the cost sharing for the visit and the necessary testing will be waived. They're also saying that tests necessary to diagnose other respiratory illnesses, the cost sharing for those will be waived as well. So in order for you to be paid 100% for these services, you need to append uh, modifier CS to the claim lines that are subject to the cost share waiver. This is effective um, when implemented April 7th, but effective March 18th. So you will have to go back and reprocess all of those claims in order to be paid 100% that you had submitted prior to this um, information coming out. You should be reaching out to your MAC to find out how they want you to um, go ahead and, and implement that reprocessing uh, process. Um, also, the pending condition code DR for institutional claims this guidance has changed three times since March 31st. The current guidance that came out um, April 10th and then was supported again in the, um, the COVID page on, on April 15th says that institutional claims do require the DR condition code. LCDs and NCDs frequently say that medical necessity requires face-to-face -face performance of the particular um, 
services within that LCD or NCD. As a result of this public health emergency, that particular um, criteria has been waived because a lot of this is being done via telehealth now. So other, uh, other um, guidance within the LCDs and NCDs remain, but the face-to-face -face, um, element has been waived. Likewise, the direct supervision during this uh, public health emergency, if services require direct supervision, that is just now can be performed via telehealth. So the um, practitioner being supervised doesn't need to be in the exact same physical location as the supervising physician. They can be communicating via audio and visual telecommunication as well. As of April 9th, they're saying doctors can remotely communicate with nurse practitioners and provide rural care at, uh, provide care at rural hospitals and the doctor can communicate via phone, radio, or online communication. This change is a little bit different from the guidance that came out on uh, March 31st that said nurse practitioners and PAs can act as the uh, physician of record in inpatient during this public health emergency. So this changes that a little bit. It just says that nurse practitioners can be in that position and under the, um, it, within communication with the provider. Likewise, occupational therapists can perform home health agency assessments during this period for certain homebound patients. And hospice nurses can kind of be relaxed for some of their in-service training tasks for the AIDS. Long-term care facilities as of April 13th can um, transfer or discharge patients amongst themselves so that we can kind of manage this outbreak that we're seeing in a lot of long-term care facilities where a lot of patients might need to be quarantined or isolated during this period so that they can kind of work together to make sure this happens and the other re residents can remain safe. CMS is allowing the use of AC ASCs to provide hospital services. If you're using your ASC as hospital space, you do have to enroll and bill at a, as a hospital during this public health emergency, and their practices that are being performed there have to be consistent with the state emergency preparedness or pandemic plan. Otherwise, you can use those ASCs as hospital space. You can also use other non-hospital buildings and spaces for patient care, as long as that is in compliance as well. Lots of places are set, setting up what we call um, the parking lot or drive-through testing services. And this is being allowed by CMS and by almost every state Medicaid and by lots of other payers. It's requiring that you put condition code A7 on the hospital claims for mobile units. Screening within those areas is not subject to EMTALA. However, if the patient enters your emergency room, you can't then send them back out to your mobile screening areas. They ha once they're in the emergency room, EMTALA does apply. Now, one thing to consider about this is lots of people or lots of facilities are setting up their screening centers outside. Now, this, the HICPIC codes for collection of the specimens are on the lab fee schedule, and we're still trying to work out how Medicare, we know they want the A7 condition code, and we know they need to put these HICPICs on it, but they're still connecting the dots between those two. So you might get denials your first pass through. Waivers for hospitals, and, oh, sorry. So the CARES Act, when this was implemented, it allowed hospitals and labs to um, perform tests at home and in other community-based settings outside of the hospital. Lots of employers are actually having labs come in and test their staff on site, and that's allowed according to this. The accelerated advance payments is something that many, many hospitals are taking advantage of because as John mentioned, everybody's um, processes are really in a disarray during this period. You may have shut down or, or seriously limited your, um, your sur surgery centers and things like that. So some services are way up, other services are way down. This allows you to request from Medicare, if you're an OPPS or Part A or Part B provider, 100% of your Medicare payments for the previous three month period. You can get that in advance and have 210 days to repay it. If you're critical access, you can request up to 125% of the payment within the six month period and have a year to repay it. Automatic recoupment begins 120 days from this is issued. We don't yet have the remit code this will be under for those of you who get electronic deposits so we can track this appropriately. But it's important for you to let your business office know this is happening and have an adjustment code set up in your system so that you can track this. You need to be able to reconcile what they say they've recouped 
with what they've recouped so that you can make sure you're whole at the end of this. As of April 10th, which is the last time this website was updated, there's been $63 billion uh, requested as a result of this. Each state has different changes they're putting through as a result of this public health emergency. They have three different ways they can do it. Now, states have the authority to make rules for Medicaid for many, many circumstances. And a lot of them are implementing different rules under their just state authority as a result of this public health emergency. They can also apply for 1135 waivers, which kind of piggybacks on the federal 1135 waiver. And this, they have specific things they can apply for, and it has to be approved by the federal government. The Appendix K waivers is the same process, but has a few different options on it, and also has to be approved by the federal government. So I have links down here where you can track um, the waivers that have been submitted and approved by your state for both 1135 and Appendix K. So you can track and see what your particular state Medicaid is doing. Wow, Lori. I mean, you know, just just the amount and the flow and the volume of updates, it, it, it just is unprecedented. And I know that we've talked, um, you know, collectively, and I don't think any of us have ever seen uh, this volume of changes, some major, some minor, some contradictory, uh, you know, like you mentioned, having CMS go one way, but having state Medicaid go another way. I think one of the things that this really uh, hits home on is the fact that you need a team and a holistic approach here to address these things. Um, you need to make sure that your business office staff has a seat at the table. They need to understand what it means when you start worrying about, like Lori is talking about from a recruitment standpoint. You need to have real solid controls that are in place. And, you know, if you don't, you're going to end up having issues down the road. So we know that this is com coming. We need to be prepared for it. But the only way for us to really allow our revenue cycle to perf perform exceptionally is to take some of these updates, figure out where we are with things, test and, you know, kind of have a, instead of a hope and a faith process with your revenue cycle, you know, it's like, I hope we have it all, but I, you know, I have faith that we know what we're doing. You need to switch that up to a trust, but verify, you know, and I trust that we've got a lot of access here, but you know, I'm going to verify that we're doing what we're supposed to do. And I think that really lines in as well with uh, a lot of questions that people have around telemedicine. So Lori, can you um, walk us through a little bit with some of the findings and some of the, the high level stuff on telemedicine as well? Sure. During the same period since March 31st, we've had lots of changes around um, the telemedicine guidance as well. So I am not going to, in the interest of time, we're not going to go into everything with respect to all the different telemedicine changes, just a high level summary and those changes that have changed. So uh, for telehealth, it still is the interactive technology face-to-face -face internet connection. For Medicare, it has to be audio and visual. Lots of states are allowing an audio component to telehealth. So you will have some challenges where Medicare may have required the telephone code for audio only, and Medicaid is accepting the, the um, telehealth codes for audio only. If you have crossover situations, you're going to have to really manage that appropriately. Since we last spoke, um, Medicare is now requiring modifier 95 for telehealth. For telehealth. But the telephone visits still have to be initiated by the patient still have separate codes for practitioners and professionals, and there's just been a few minor changes to that that we'll discuss. Likewise, for remote visits and virtual check-ins, we'll just be really talking about changes within those services. Um, telehealth services have always been accepted by Medicare, Medicaid, and most commercial payers. There's been some change in the guidance uh, with respect to these services. A lot more services have been added, and um, a lot more, some other types of practitioners have been relaxed for state, not for federal. Federal is the same list of practitioners. Traditionally, these had been, the patient either had to be in a some sort of healthcare facility, so in a hospital or a practice that had um, HIPAA compliant software. It also had to be in a rural area so that we could kind of explain why the patient and the practitioner could not easily get to one another. Now, the patient can be anywhere, including the patient's home, and they don't need to be in a rural area. The practitioner for Medicare can also be in a site other than their office. Medicare on March 23rd said practitioners must furnish distance site telehealth services if they're doing it from their home. They have to use the MAC hotline 
to verbally update their practice location over the phone. And this change would be effective immediately. Um, this is not intended to be used for that doctor who runs home for lunch and takes a few vis uh, visits on the phone. This is if the doctor is maybe in isolation and in quarantine or something like that. And for a period of time, will be working from home. In that case, you want to use this uh, process to update it. Now, Subsequent to this, a single line came out in conversations on some of these um, calls that are constantly happening with CMS that said there are no changes required. However, I have not seen that in writing anywhere. So I would say if your Mac still has the hotline up, you should still be making this change and making sure your doctors are aware of it. And also be aware that these guidelines that we're talking about for federal apply to federal only, not necessarily to state. The originating site code 23014 is for the originating site fee. That's if the patient is still in some sort of healthcare center, that originating site gets to bill this. I get lots of questions that uh, for provider-based, can the distance site bill this for the facility component? And the answer is no, Medicare does not allow that. We did see an expansion of telehealth services. Um, according to Medicare's website, they've added 80 services to their telehealth plan. Lots of these services, if you look at them, these services were approved before, but they allowed for the HICPIC to be reported. Now they're allowing for the CPT to be reported as well. So you do have to kind of take a look at your practices and see if the CPT makes more sense to you to bill under the CPT for these services. They have added additional services to it as well, but a lot of these are just a change in the method of billing. I want to note that for physical therapy and occupational therapy services, this has been added to the approved um, services list for telehealth, but it's still only for eligible practitioners. And therapists are not on the eligible practitioner list for Medicare. So still, these services are intended to be performed by MDs, DOs, and non-physician practitioners, not by therapists. Lots of states are allowing physical therapists, so again, you have to kind of make a determination how you're going to treat those patients if you're doing Medicaid. You know, you can't provide different services based on the type of insurance, so we have to deal with the notification that will go to Medicare patients if you're offering the service to Medicaid patients. For the ENM services via telehealth, we've recognized that now, since new patients are allowed for telehealth, we have struggles with how we're going to document the services because for new patients, you need an element from the history, the exam, and the medical decision making, and yet it's difficult to um, kind of document that exam portion for the new patients. So Lori will be talking about this in a little bit detail a, a little bit further down the presentation, but for now, we're going to talk about Medicare has accepted time documentation only for outpatient services. If you're going to document time, it, you have to note that it requires 50% of the time spent counseling or in coordination of care. You can also level the visit based on medical decision making only. This change was going into effect in 2021 anyway, so Medicare during this public health emergency has said we can kind of use that guidance. If you're leveling from medical decision making only, you still have to document the elements of history that are necessary to support the visit, but you would determine the level based on medical decision making. Previously, for telehealth services, Medicare said you had to use place of service O2 telehealth. But as of March 30th, they said you should be using the place of service that would have been reported had the patient been seen in person. And this is so you can get paid appropriately. If you were, for instance, a freestanding practice using place of service 11, you'll get paid on the physician fee schedule on the non-facility price. If you're a provider-based or it's a hospital-based service, you'll get paid off at the facility fee schedule for the physician fee schedule only. This has no impact to how hospitals will get paid. This is all about how the physicians will get paid. And it doesn't mean since they're paying the physician more for private practice that they intend to accept the facility component for provider base. They're saying they are not doing that. This is with respect to uh, physician payment only. If you continue to use place service O2, you'll get paid off of the corresponding facility fee schedule. So if this isn't impacting your payment and Medicare and Medicaid and other payers are still requiring place of service O2, you might consider doing that just to make your crossover claims flow more easily. However, if it's impacting your payment, you should use the fee schedule that gets paid the most. You can go forward, John, thank you. 
Likewise, as of March 30th, they've relaxed a lot of the limitations because we want to do as many things via telehealth as possible so that the patient and the practitioners can both remain safe. As a result, they're saying the guidance that said telehealth could only be performed inpatient every three days and subsequent skilled nursing every 30 days, those guidelines have been relaxed, as has the, the guidance that said critical care can only be once per day via telehealth. For end-stage renal disease, there's no requirement right now for a monthly hands-on examination of the vascular access site or for telehealth being allowed once only every three months. The HIPAA guidance has been changed here as well because when we had the patient in um, an originating site and the practitioner in a distant site, both were using HIPAA encrypted technology. Now we have people using their own cell phones or computers technically on either side. So what they're saying here is practice good faith HIPAA guidance. Try and be as, as careful as you can, but they're recognizing that HIPAA cannot be completely controlled using that technology. Now for the telehealth options, we went over this before in our last um, presentation, so I'm just gonna hit upon the highlights here. I wanna stress that the Practitioners that can be located in the distant site to perform these services, that list has not changed. It is exactly the same. They haven't added new practitioners to it. They have said that as far as the, the code to report, as of March 30th, you can use the ENMs that are effective for the service and you can use that expanded list. Prior to that, you would use the HICPICs for ED, for initial inpatient, subsequent, and SNF, et cetera. Now you can use the um, CPTs for that for those services. For billing requirements, they've added modifier 95 for telehealth. If you're reporting on a UB for uh, critical access method two, you will continue to report the GT. But if you're reporting on a 1500, use 95 um, for telehealth. As of April 7th, I talked about the cost sharing and this has changed the way we process as well. Don't forget, you have to go back to March 18th and reprocess in order to get your 100% payment. And if you've already billed patients for their cost sharing during that period, you have to make sure that they're refunded if they've paid. The guidance around the DR condition code and the CR modifiers, like I said, has changed several times. So I would recommend taking a look at the MedLearn Matters SE20011 for clarity. That's the document that has changed three times. And the most current um, requirement on that particular MedLearn Matters is the condition code for institutional claims, CR modifier, as long as it's not telehealth. And, and that's for the CR modifier for both. But it can be waived for non-telehealth, for telehealth professionals, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Max have been seeing a lot of issues because of the confusion around what place of service do, we should be using. Some people are using both place of service and 11 and place of service 02 on the same claim, or some other, so place of service 22 and place of service 02 on the same claim. You cannot mix those for paper claims. It has to be, the entire claim has to be the same place of service. So these claims are being rejected and returned to the provider. Make sure you get this right because mitigating this and correcting your claims and getting it back out there to be paid can be an expensive process. We really have a lot of confusion around the guidance for RHCs and FQHCs telehealth. Prior to this public health emergency, RHCs and FQHCs could not be the distant site. And um, so they could only you know, be the, the um, originating site for these services. However, as of April 8th, they said that, you, I'm sorry, as of March 31st, they said that both FQHCs and RHCs can act as the distant site and perform telehealth services. When that came out in the interim final rule, they say you will not be paid on the traditional payment mechanisms. An FQHC couldn't be paid off of their PPS and an RHC couldn't be paid off of their all-inclusive rate. They're saying that the secretary is gonna develop some other method um, that will be reimbursed during this period and it will be something like the physician fee schedule. But they haven't really clarified what that is. And so since we don't know how it's going to be paid, we also don't know how it should be billed. On April 8th, since we still didn't have any information, I did email CMS and I said, since we're not gonna get paid off of the current um, payment mechanisms, should we assume these are non 
RHC and non-FQHC services? And if so, are we going to build them on a 1500? And if so, what place of service should we use? Should we use the O2 or should we follow the guidance that it's the, where the service would have been performed in absence of this public health emergency? Because in reality, these services would not have been performed in absence of the public health emergency. The answer I got back was we kind of, we still don't know. We're still working on this and continue to look at these pages for updates. I've looked every day. Unfortunately, we still don't have an answer. So since we don't know how to build these, you're probably going to have to hold those claims. If you submit them, they'll probably reject from the audio adjudicator because the MACs don't have any guidance on this right now. So no, that's um, you know, good information, Lori. Thank you. Hey, uh, Lori Beaudry, um, I get a lot of questions uh, when I'm talking with hospitals and physician practices, you know, just surrounding some uh, documentation concerns that they have when it comes to these telehealth visits. Can you um, just kind of go through some guidelines and give us some best practices and pointers just to make sure that, you know, our, our clinicians are, are uh, documenting appropriately and have a very compliant claim? Sure, John. So what they're saying for the telehealth visit, since you'll be billing an E&M code, what they would like to see is the same documentation as if you are performing it face-to-face. -face. Some of that makes it more difficult since you're not seeing the patient and you can't do a true physical exam, but CMS has given an example of a physical exam. They are saying that um, if you're, as Laurie stated earlier, if you're using counseling, time dominates, then you need to make sure that the time is documented and it must state that it was greater than 50% of the time spent counseling and coordination. However, if you're not using time, you're using medical decision making, they're still looking for you to document um, the E&M. So they're looking, in addition, that you state that the patient initiated the request for care that you introduced yourself, you received verbal consent from the patient to proceed with the video and audio communication. Um, you should also verify the patient's name and date of birth. Um, the reasons for visit or chief complaint should be documented. Um, elements of the HPI, as much as you can get, should be documented. Any pertinent relevant history, past medical history, family history should be documented. Your assessment and plan should also be documented. It's important, um, especially when you're using your medical decision making as your um, guide. CMS's example that they put out as a physical exam is skin color. You can document skin lesions or rashes. You can document a quality of respiration. You can document evidence of wheezing or dyspnea or vital signs as reported by the patient as they have a fever, et cetera. That's, that's great, Lori. So, Lori Daigle, can you just um, kind of update us, too, on the any changes that have happened surrounding telephone visits? Yeah, there's just some, some confusion about what CMS requests for te or requires for telephone visits, because in the interim final rule, it's about a 225-page document. And within the first few pages, it discusses how audio um, video technology is acceptable for telehealth, and there may be some examples where audio only is required. So a lot of people interpreted that to say, oh, we can use audio only for telehealth. However, if you go down to about page 220, it specifies there that telephone codes are still telephone codes, and audio only have to follow the CPT um, descriptions of the AMA telephone codes. You cannot consider this um, telehealth for Medicare. Expect some denials on these processes because the, the guidance and the interpretations have been so fluid, the MACs have not been catching up with this. Just as a reminder, the codes have not changed. You're going to follow the guidance in the um, telephone codes from the AMA, and there are separate codes for practitioners and non-physician um, professionals. And the difference between these two is that for the practitioners, they use evaluation and management. For other healthcare professionals, they use assessment and management. Everything else is exactly the same. Okay. Terrific. And Lori Beaudry, can you just uh, walk through, because this may also be, uh, you know, an area of confusion, because maybe a lot of practitioners have not really used these codes and had to document them. So um, can you give us a couple of pointers and updates on how best to do this as well? Sure. In the example that we provided you, you'll see that there is a space for the total amount of minutes. This is a time-based code, and therefore time must be documented. In addition, they're also, again, looking for you that, to state that the patient initiated the request, that you introduced yourself, 
that you received verbal consent for the patient to proceed with this audio communication, that you've verified the patient's date of birth. You should put any relevant history, uh, chief complaint, um, any, any portion that you can get while you're on the telephone, um, as well as an assessment and a plan. But as you notice, we added a, a sentence in here that said, I spent the entirety of this and you would fill in the minutes for the telephone visit discussing the patient's symptoms of, and again, reiterate what the patient's symptom was, what the injury was, what their complaint was. Terrific, thank, thank you, Lori. Lori Daigle, uh, any updates or changes when it comes to online visits? Just that um, as of March 30th, new patients have been added for the duration of this public health emergency only. So as of now, new patients can communicate via the portal or some sort of secure encrypted email and, and bill for these services. Everything else remains the same. It's CPTs for practitioners and they're time-based. And these are considered evaluation and management services practitioners. Okay, and, and no changes really happened when it comes when it came to the other other healthcare professionals. It, it, it's consistent with what you just said as well, correct? Right. Just as a reminder for um, the other healthcare professionals, is that the word evaluation and assessment mean two different things to CMS. So in this one, AMA neglected to use the word assessment. They called it evaluation and management for their other healthcare professionals. So CMS implemented their own set of codes so they could substitute that one word. Everything else remains the same. Okay. And Lori Beaudry, maybe you can give us a couple um, quick pointers on, because I know that a lot of practitioners have never really touched these documentation um, constraints before. Um, what, what, what is your suggestion and process around these, please? Sure, um, again, we gave you an example of what an online documentation could look like. Um, again, this is also time-based, so they're looking for you to put the start and stop time or the entirety of the minutes in this call. Again, you need to state that the patient initiated the request, that the consent was received via the portal to proceed with an electronic communication. You should verify the patient's name and date of birth via the portal. Um, document the chief complaint or the reason that the patient initiated the um, communication. Again, the total number of minutes with a summary of what the plan was so that you can um, document this in the medical record appropriately. Excellent, excellent. Um, Lori Daigle, any new updates on the virtual check-in uh, codes? No, just a reminder that this is store and forward technology. There has to be some information coming in. Um, you know, it could be films, it could be other information being sent by the patient, and it has to be stored in the medical record. And just as a reminder, too, this is a professional only service. Even though a lot of this work may be done by the nurses when the records are being pulled in and collated, et cetera, it's still professional only. For the virtual check in codes, um, a lot of uh, facilities have just stopped using this because the G2012 brief communication technology mirrors the telephone five to 10 minute code pretty much exactly. So for that one, it, that's been some confusion around that. If you ever did use it, you might want to continue using it just so that your utilization um, trends look correct. Otherwise, a lot of places aren't even using this. And for the RAC FQHC, they added new patients. And because of that, increased the price, the price as of March 30th. So the remote patient wa uh, monitoring, this is, hasn't changed really at all, except for new patients are um, added to the list. And this does require, as Laurie has been saying, verbal consent. The patient has to be aware. However, this is technology the patients have been using. They have to have something in their home transmitting this information, so they're usually aware of this. This is over a 30-day period. And the codes may be specific to um, the, the information that's flowing over, or it just might be the collection of uh, physiological data. Terrific, terrific. Um, so we wanted to take a couple of minutes now um, to kind of bring some of this stuff together. And Lori Beaudry uh, walked through some of the documentation concerns. But what we also wanted to have her do was walk you guys through and bring some people up to date on uh, some challenges that our coders are facing regarding some new codes, uh, specifically around COVID. So, so Lori, could you walk through some of the, the findings and the concerns that you, you've identified? Sure. 
I think the most important thing to understand with all of the changes that are happening that Laurie just walked us through that occur daily almost, we have new codes that have been put out, um, unprecedented that they have released a new code in the middle of a year um, that has happened. However, our coding rules have not happened, have not changed. The coders still need to be um, cognitive of the fact that certain diagnoses have an underlying etiology or a manifestation. And the sequencing of those codes is the etiology is first and the manifestation is second. That is particularly um, needed now with the new U071 code. Um, we also have use an additional code. There are two codes sometimes that are required to fully describe a condition. And again, it follows the same sequencing etiology, that etiology comes first and manifestation comes second. So as we all know, on March 18th, the CDC um, announced that there was going to be a new COVID code of the UO 7.1. Um, this was um, effective with dates of service April 1st. Hopefully all of you have this already put into your computer systems as well as any of the encoders that you use. Um, everybody had to update their systems in order to accommodate this new code. It is meant to be a primary code. It is not meant to be a secondary code, which is the reason we gave you the etiology and the manifestations. This is the etiology code, and they're looking for you to call the manifestations as secondary. This new code excludes the coronavirus of an unspecified site. It excludes coronavirus as a cause of diseases classified elsewhere, the B9729, which is what we were told to use prior to October 1st, April 1st. And any of the accounts discharged before April 1st will continue to use that code. It also excludes the severe acute respiratory syndrome. For outpatient coding, um, their guidelines stayed the same. They cannot capture presumptive, suspected, presumed. Um, they have to have an actual definitive diagnosis. Um, the coding clinic dated uh, March 24th came out and it said that a presumptive positive COVID test could be coded as positive, that you no longer need to wait for the CDC to come back in and say, yes, it's positive. Again, I want to make sure that they understand that the word presumptive positive is the key to this. It's not just a presumptive code. For the outpatient coders, if a patient has suspected COVID-19, you're going to use the Z28 to 8. That is if a test result has not come back and the patient came in with symptoms of COVID and they have had exposure to COVID. Z03818 is in count of observation, but it has been ruled out. That means the test has come back, they came in with signs and symptoms and it was ruled out. You'll use these both as secondary codes. They are meant to be manifestation codes. They can now code suspected, possible, probable. The COVID signs and symptoms would be, your signs and symptoms would be coded along with an appropriate Z code. I'm not sure if we had discussed this on the last um, presentation, but it is important that maybe the hospitals put policies together, such as holding a PATH report, that the ED accounts or the lab accounts are held waiting for the two to three days for the lab to come back and it can be appropriately coded with the Z03818 or the signs and symptoms of, along with the Z20828. From an inpatient standpoint, again, the rules have not changed. The primary diagnosis is that that is chiefly responsible for the admission of the patient requiring hospitalization. The entire medical record should be reviewed to establish this principal diagnosis. Coded as if the code exists, if probable, suspected, or any such trends of uncertainty or unconfirmed in principal diagnosis. That remains the same. It would be very unusual that a patient would be discharged at this point with COVID positive without them having the test result before they left. Um, two of the two or more conditions that equally meet the principal reason, you would the sequence is determined by the circumstances of the admission, the therapy or treatment provided, and the code first rules apply. Um, this becomes important when you have sepsis with COVID. Um, following the official ICD-10 coding guidelines, if a COVID-19 progresses to sepsis, sepsis then becomes the primary code, and the COVID-19, the UO7.1, becomes the secondary code as a, local, as a localized infection. This should be coded now as a secondary diagnosis. That is the only time the UO7.1 becomes a secondary diagnosis. So along with the new code came new DRGs. So 
um, the MSDRG version 37.1 R1 became effective April 1. Hopefully you've all had this loaded into your system and you've all had it loaded into encoders. Um, it was used to validate the correct coding of the claims and discharges on or after April 1st. These are not used for the patients that were discharged March 31st and prior. Um, two additional um, DRGs um, that we're going to mention the other DRGs in the next screen are the patients that are on a mechanical vent. They would be 207 and 208. Again, U07.1 would be your primary diagnosis, but your ICD-10 procedure will then dictate your DRG. So along with the U07.1, we now have eight DRGs that this could flow into. The first three are all the respiratory infections. The second two are newborns or neonates. And the last three are HIV infections. It is important to know that if you use the U071 as a principal diagnosis, it only excludes itself as acting as an MCC under the CC exclusion list. So some of the MCCs for um, 177 or 791 or 794 would be pneumonia, would be acute respiratory distress syndrome. It would be acute renal failure or CHF if exacerbated. There are several others. I just wanted to give you some examples. It's very important to note that acute respiratory distress is not an MCC for these accounts. So this is when it becomes important that you have either the coders working with the providers or CDI working with the providers to make sure that they understand the difference in that one word where it could fall and make a difference in your DRG. Um, the codes that we have given you on this sheet, this is one of the sheets John was talking about. This is a good takeaway for some of you coders, and this is for discharges prior to April 1st. This is for both inpatient and outpatient. If a definitive diagnosis is um, determined, you would code the pneumonia, or you would code the acute bronchitis. You would code the bronchitis not otherwise specified as acute, lower respiratory infection, respiratory infection not otherwise specified, or acute respiratory distress you would code these in addition to the B97.21. Again, this is discharges prior to April 1st. So it's important that the coders have both. I know we're in the middle of April, but there still may be some accounts floating around waiting for physician documentation that haven't been coded yet. Terrific, Lori. Uh, Lori Daigle, um, are there any quick updates just from uh, COVID-19 lab tests that we need to mention? Uh, just some clarification around this. You can bill the um, handling and conveyance specimen for transfer to the lab, the 99000 and 99001, depending on where it's collected. However, all payers aren't accepting that. Some will be bundling it in. Medicare right now is bundling it in. And also clarity around the G2023 and G2024. Lots of this is happening, this specimen collection is happening in, you know, parking lots in an area set up such as that. Medicare has given us guidance that for those locations, we should put the A7 condition code. They've also given guidance that these codes are payable on the clinical lab fee schedule. They haven't connected the dots that the hospital can use the clinical lab guidance. So since they're giving us the A7 condition code for hospitals, it's kind of confusing around this right now. We're looking constantly for updates for them to connect the dots on these two, but be looking to your max to see how they're going to handle that. Okay. And, and I think um, just as Lori Beaudry mentioned with the previous uh, screen, this, this is a, a screen that you should uh, print it and hand out to your business office staff just as a, a reference. I think it's a terrific piece uh, so that especially as we're handling denials, we're handling uh, clean claims, you know, it, the more uh, detail that they can have, the better. And, and I think this also ties in um, very nicely with, you know, the fact that we've got a lot of supervisors and team leads and directors who, you know, really haven't uh, managed people remotely. They're kind of used to having face to face. They're used to, you know, uh, having meetings in the conference room and seeing people's responses to questions and answers and such. And, and what we're really seeing now is we're seeing a lot of stress being put on uh, the management of a lot of people remotely. And what I wanted to do is uh, give both, um, uh, Lori Baudry a chance to kind of talk through a little bit of what she's found uh, from a, a coding perspective and then Lori Daigle from a, a business office perspective. So uh, Lori Baudry, can you, you help us with what you're, you're seeing across the industry just now from a, a, a remote coding staff supervisory standpoint? Sure. Um, we're finding that policies and processes are inadequate for security. Um, this 
needs to be discussed with the coders. You might want to put a policy together, send it to them so that they understand when to shut off their computer, when to have a password protected, when they need to sign out of the hospital system. It becomes important. Um, the emphasis that has been placed on the hospital IT support, um, it, they're a little overwhelmed. They're trying the best to help the coders, but you have to remember the coders are used to having IT support. They're not used to having to do anything on their own, so they might need to reach out to them and need some additional help. Um, there's a lot of imbalance in the team in production. Um, as everybody knows, the outpatient volume has significantly decreased and the inpatient volume has significantly increased. Um, it's difficult for the supervisors to mentor and train new staff on the new guidelines and identify issues. They're, they're working with everybody as best they can, but it's really hard to get all of these new codes that are out with the coding staff. Um, Cross-training between outpatient and inpatient, it is very challenging. Outpatients are used to, I cannot code probable, and inpatients are used to, I can code probable, and what does my um, primary diagnosis need to be? Um, on the positive side, there are new skills that are being developed, and that is when the supervisors do have time to mentor their staff. Um, there's a lot of education online. There are a lot of companies that are offering education. It might be helpful to you to have the outpatient coding staff take some online training courses. We're finding it very, very helpful. Um, supervisors and directors are forging new and improved relationships. Um, most of them were in meetings most of the days, and now their meetings are virtual, giving them a little bit more time to actually reach out to their coding staff. It's really important that they communicate with the coding staff via email, via phone calls, every day. Um, and I think a really important thing is I think administration is actually gaining a real appreciation of what coding is all about, how difficult it is, and how challenging it is for them to work with all of the coding changes that come at them every day and making sure that they've documented everything and captured everything that they could. Thank, thank you, Lori. So, um, Lori Daigle, to, to build off of what um, Lori just mentioned, can you just give us some high points on what you're seeing from a, a billing office standpoint and people working remotely? Sure. They're having all of the same challenges that we're seeing in coding. Um, I would say probably magnified a bit because a lot of them aren't used to working at home. Um, they have distractions at home. They have, you know, kids at home. They're not getting the technical support they've gotten in the past as well. They have to be reminded constantly about HIPAA. They, you know, if they're used to just kind of reaching over and speaking with their peers, they can't be sending texts saying, hey, can you take a look at this account for me? Or taking screenshots of, 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 a, of their screen and sending it to a peer. Those aren't HIPAA compliant. They have to be very, very cognizant of HIPAA. Um, were, if they are the ones responsible for constantly going out and double checking and triple checking these updates because they're happening so quickly, this is probably a very new world for them and they're gonna need a lot of support around that. They're going to have to be reprocessing claims quite a bit because this guidance is changing so quickly and a lot of it is retroactive, and yet they will still be responsible for keeping the cash flowing. So there's a lot of anxiety happening around these changes in the business office. The managers and supervisors are not used to working at home themselves, probably, and they're not used to managing remote staff. So they kind of have to take a step back take a deep breath and recognize that they're the leaders here and everybody else's world is changing dramatically. They have to figure out how to stay in constant contact, how to offer the support necessary through all of these changes. Um, they have to make sure they put implementate thing, implement things that scrutinize every single denial more effectively. Question everything. Every denial should, should see, or underpayment even, should see at least two sets of eyes for approval before it gets accepted because Everything now is changing. Well, no, thank you. Thank you, Lori. You know, as, as we bring this um, rapid fire presentation to a close, um, you know, we want to just kind of tie everything together here. So let, let's remember. So the foundation of our revenue cycle, it's absolutely being tested. And we all know success is not going to happen by accident. All of the uh, details that both Lori's have provided, you know, requires a level of sophistication, knowledge, uh, experience to be able to vet the information, to be able to figure out how to incorporate it into our process. Success is going to happen by making sure that we've got the right people doing things at the right time. And we're providing from an administrative standpoint, clear metrics. And we're saying we need all hands on deck. 
it is not a time for the old way of doing things or the us versus them or, you know, this is the way that we've always done things. All of those cards need to be ripped up because we've never had to do things like this before. So we need to make sure that administration continues to provide access to data and provide information, and that is a priority. We need to keep that constant flow. We've got to make sure that our staff has the ability and skill to monitor and stay abreast of changing regulations and payer guidelines. Historically, a lot of times we go into hospitals and they're not up to date. And this is stuff that may have happened at the beginning of the year, and we're talking to them in early summer. Now, Lori has talked about, you know, the 90 updates that happened during the month of March alone just on this. And you look at that and say, we can't be allowing ourselves to be that behind. So we need to make sure that that's a priority. We got to utilize our revenue cycle steering committee to ensure that all aspects of the revenue cycle are measured and managed. We got to make sure that we have a good aspect of command and control. At the same time, we can't, we have to remember, we cannot focus on the impact to your patients. This cannot be something that we, we put on the periphery. We've got to make sure that as we start moving forward, we make communication and rescheduling and access to our hospital simple and easy. You know, a lot of us will say that revenue cycle, we, two words we never use are simple and easy, right? Well, now we've got to find a way to make sure that as we're reintegrating patients who are going to maybe be worried about coming back into our hospital, we've got to make sure that we've got the answers and we're making it easy. We've got to make sure that we're visiting those payer and government websites daily for benefit coding and claims processing updates. Assign responsibility and set the expectation that you've got specific people who will keep looking, bringing that information back and collectively we will vet that. We've got to make sure that we're reviewing our telehealth and telemedicine codes. They're evolving. We've got differences between Medicaid, CMS, Blue Cross, Aetna. How do we balance that out? Do we have, uh, are we thinking on paper and making sure that we're identifying all of those changes and making sure that the processes support those changes so that we've got clean claims that go out? Okay. We've got to make sure that we're communicating across all platforms, and we've got to make sure that we address problems and resolve them. We don't kick them down the road. We don't, you know, pretend that they didn't happen. We've got to root cause them, make it so that they don't re reoccur, and we force and go forward and find the next problem and keep doing that. You know, so solve the problem, move forward. You know, we always say that constant informed action is the key to your success in your revenue cycle. And the re only way to improve is to focus, communicate, and innovate. And I think we're seeing a lot of that coming through across the country right now. We're seeing a lot of innovation and we're seeing new levels of focus and communication, which is tremendous. So one of the things that we want to do is we've got a lot of good questions today and we just wanted to take a couple of minutes as we end here to address those for you. Um, first question going out to um, Lori Beaudry, and this is specific to can facilities split bill telehealth services, and likewise, can facilities bill Q3014 when a patient is home? Now, I know, I think on the 14th, you were part of a conference call that had a lot of fiscal intermediaries where uh, this was addressed. Um, uh, can you just give us some updates on what you heard during that call? Sure, John. Um, it was with several of the um intermediaries. Um, NGS was on there, CGS, WPS, Neridian, Palmetto um, were some of them that were on the call and it was very clearly stated that there is no originating site fee when the patient is at home. The originating site fee was meant for the site to be paid when the patient was on their physical premise but now they're at home so there is no billing of the Q3014 for the facilities when the patient is at home. Okay. Okay. And, and Lori Daigle, this, this coincides with a lot of feedback and questions that you're seeing uh, surrounding this issue as well, correct? Yes, and, and hospitals are asking for how we handle the provider-based portion, the facility component. And they're really saying, uh, a lot of what I'm hearing is, well, since the uh, private practice is getting paid more on the physician fee schedule, doesn't that mean that we should get paid the provider-based portion on um, for the technical fee? And again, CMS has very clearly stated that in a couple of FAQs and in some of these phone calls, that there is no um, technical component of a telehealth service. So we cannot bill on the um, facility side. Now, I did see uh, um, one of the uh, major insurance companies recently put in their provider updates 
that they wanted the facility component to be using the standard HIC-PIC code. However, when they were questioned, called back in questions and said, is this really what you meant? Uh, they kind of backtracked a little bit and said they didn't really think that was what the intention was and that they would look to update their um, newsletter. So again, that's another example of where we can't ne necessarily trust everything that's in writing. We have to constantly be looking back. But as of right now, there is no um, technical component to a telehealth service. Terrific. Um, Lori Daigle, question to you. Which modifier comes first if I need to report a telehealth visit resulting in a COVID-19 test? Well, really, you know, they haven't specifically come out and said that, but guidance has always been use the ones that impact payments first. So if it's for cost sharing, you want to use the modifier CS first. And then you would use the appropriate modifier 95 if it was on a 1500 or GT if it was a, um, the critical access billing the method two version, the method two. Okay, great. Uh, Lori Beaudry, is uh, CMS enforcing an established relationship requirement currently? No, they're saying that they're going to waive that for now or they're not going to audit it there um, for the established patient for the telehealth visits. Okay, terrific. Uh, Lori Daigle, um, should we append modifier CS to every line of a visit if the visit includes um, in order for the COV, um, you know, the COVID-19 testing? Not necessarily. It only should be appended if the line um, is eligible for cost sharing. And those services that are eligible for cost sharing is the visit itself, that made the determination that the COVID test was necessary and was either ordered or administered. Any additional testing that might be necessary for respiratory illnesses and uh, the COVID test itself. Okay. Um, question for Lori Beaudry. What level E&M service is CMS allowing under the PCP direct supervision rule currently? They're saying that um, the teaching physicians may be supervised either by phone or through interactive telecommunications and that all five levels in the primary care centers will be payable if they're provided under the direct supervision. Okay, okay. Um, Lori Daigle, um, interesting question here. Can you tell me if diabetic RNs are allowed to conduct telehealth or can they only do virtual visits? They question. cannot do telehealth. It is, uh, RNs are not on the list of eligible practitioners, so they cannot um, initiate or perform a telehealth visit. Okay. And um, last question, but I think it is by far the most frequent, other than the split billing question um, that you know we see continuously, is, is why doesn't CMS allow therapists, so specifically the PTOT and speech, to perform telehealth? And likewise, will Medicare update their guidance to include physical and occupational therapists for telehealth? Lori Daigle, what are you thinking? <laughs> well, I certainly can't say why they won't accept it. Um, and as, as far as will they update their guidance, I can't really say that either. I will say that when I've been on calls with, you know, participating in calls with CMS, they have noted that this is the number one question and concern they get, that this is the number one feedback they get is why can't we use uh, rehab services. They have noted that this is under consideration, but so far they haven't made that change. Okay. Well, there's still hope. So we'll keep asking and we'll keep looking. Um, well, I want to take a couple seconds here and just thank um, both Lori Daigle and Lori Beaudry for their insights and their experience today. And I really hope that everyone who's um, listening to this has found some um, valuable information to be able to go back and uh, inform their revenue cycle and, you know, institute a process of trust but verify. Um, we've included a whole host of uh, resources in the slide deck. So by all means, what we would hope that you would do as well is use this as a way to um, balance and kind of vet 
what resources you currently have, um, and then go through and, and, and if you do have a lengthy list, and one of the things that we mentioned is, you know, assign specific people uh, the responsibility to go through and monitor these websites and come back to the team with issues, questions, and concerns. Um, we want to make sure that you don't forget that it's not only a Medicaid and Medicare thing. I mean, visit your commercial sites. Um, make sure that you're bringing all of those things in. If you haven't um, had a conversation with your payer reps for some of the commercial payers, now's a good time to do it. Um, make sure that you're communicating across all of the platforms. Use your Revenue Cycle Steering Committee, you know, as the conduit to get some of these answers out and use, you know, your CEO, CFO as a vehicle to go and, and make demands of people if, if they're not getting back to you. Um, make sure that people are being responsive to you both internally and externally. Um, like we mentioned earlier, you know, our goal really is to be your partner and, you know, we look at this as we're all in this together. Uh, we're all trying to, to make Make sure that we find a way to get out of this and uh, you know when when everything starts returning back to normal and we, and we see volume starting to come back and you know we've got some good news coming through that maybe some of our outpatient surgical centers will start getting opened again soon you know we've just got to make sure that you've got the ability to ask questions get and vet maybe some of the answers we have created that coding support at stridewater.com as a vehicle for you um, please use it um, one or two of both of the lorries will be looking at those they'll get back to you they'll always get back to you with the um, the documentation that they're um, putting the answers from so you'll have places so that you can look at it yourself and use it as a resource uh, so we hope that you do that uh, we encourage you to use our entire Stroudwater team um, use the resources that are being placed under the COVID section of our website um, you know as an entity we're here to, to help support and leverage uh, your success um, we want to be your partners we want to help you in any way shape perform. Um, I'm very thankful uh, that you spent your time with us today. Uh, I'm hoping that you uh, got some value out of it and that you use this presentation to really enforce and enhance your, your revenue cycle. Um, so as we start moving forward, we hope that everybody uh, keep, continues to stay well, um, moves forward. Uh, again, I want to thank um, both Lori Daigle and Lori Beaudry for their experience and, and their exceptional uh, talents that they've shown today. Um, and you know, we hope that you guys will continue to, to reach out and help, uh, uh, you know, allow us to help you. So un until we talk again, um, this is John Bain with uh, Stroudwater Revenue Cycle Solutions. Uh, again, thanking you for your time, uh, and we hope that everything keeps moving forward and that you all stay well. Uh, until next time, we'll see you soon.